Um, so our, our next presentation is uh, Dr. Osorio from the University of Oklahoma, and uh, she'll be presenting on produced water demulsification using magamite nanoparticles. Give me one second. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. There you go. We can see your screen very well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Jolie Osorio. Um, I'm not a doctor yet, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I'm a chemical engineer. I got my undergrad back in Columbia. I got my master's degree last year at the University of Oklahoma in petroleum engineering. And thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, the title of my presentation uh, is Produce Water Demusification Using Magamine Nanoparticles. Okay, so I'm going to start showing you the problem that I wanted to solve with the development of this research. Uh, the residual oil present in produced water is a big environmental problem. Uh, the main challenge for discharging the produced water is that it needs, some, it needs to meet some uh, concentration requirements. And this has been like kind of hard for the industry to achieve. Uh, some of the methods that we already have they're expensive, or they're not as efficient as we would like them to be. And in like in average, for every nine barrels of um, for every barrel of oil that is produced in uh, the U.S., nine barrels of water uh, are produced along with them. And it's kind of like hard to reuse this water because uh, so normally in, uh, onshore, what they do is like they reinjet this water uh, to keep the reservoir pressure. But then uh, it's like um, in the measure that we increase the oil production, it's kind of like, what are we going to do with all this water, right? So the objectives of my research was to synthesize magamine nanoparticles for uh, the separation of the residual oil and produce water. And technically what we wanted to do was create a new method, uh, more efficient and cheap, uh, costly efficient that allow us to do, that, to do this. Uh, we also create, we analyze the removal efficiency of in-house synthesized nanoparticle. We also analyze that the, magamide, the commercial nanoparticles that we were able to uh, find in the market, oops, sorry, in the market. And uh, so technically that's what we were trying to achieve. And for this purpose, the methodology that we uh, used. So we started, we started with a extensive literature review and then we proceed to the experimental studies, synthesis, characterization of these nanoparticles, and the uh, comparison of the performance between these nanoparticles and the ones where we, were, we found in the market. Okay, so um, I've been talking about, like, I'm pretty sure like most of us know like the problematic with the produced water. And I talk a little bit about the nanoparticles and now, so the produced water itself, so as we know, it's a fluid that is brought to the surface along with the hydrocarbons that are being produced. And the composition of this produced water is going to um, vary depending on many factors, uh, mainly uh, the well that is being extracted or the conditions in which like this water is being extracted as well. And this is one of like, the main focus of, the, uh, of this study because it's not just oil that we are targeting. I mean, we're targeting oil, but these water also have like salts and other solids that uh, make this like separation harder. Okay, so uh, the world, the water disposal right now, so has like different regulations. So the disposal limits for this water is, it has to meet 42 ppm in a daily basis or 29 ppm in a monthly average. So these uh, requirements has to be met in order to discharge uh, offshore. And uh, so we can see in, uh, in the little diagram a little bit uh, the produced water treatment right now. There are different methods. We have physical methods. Normally, uh, I think the, the, most, the most commonly used is gonna be water flotation and absorption. And then we're gonna have chemical methods. They're using demulsifiers. They're using uh, oxidation as well. The biologic, uh, biological methods are not like as widely implemented, but they're used as well. So now let me talk about a little bit of the iron oxide nanoparticles. So the iron oxides are largely used compounds. There are pretty like common compounds in the, in the nature. They can be synthesized in the lab as well. 
And uh, this, I mean, they've been around like for centuries, but now we want to use this like as um, as nanoparticles. There are eight different kinds of iron oxides or eight different kinds that we know, but we want to uh, focus our attention in three uh, iron oxides and they're gonna be hematite, magnetite and magmite. So the important of, they're like pretty similar, but at the same time, they're not. Um, so the first one I'm gonna talk about is hematite. Hematite is a ferrimagnetic, an anti-ferrimagnetic uh, compound. So that means that we're not gonna have any behavior or any response when we apply a, a magnetic field, an external magnetic field. So it's kind of like, okay. So they're good for other applications, but in our case, uh, magamite was the center of uh, our research. Magnetite as well, magnetite, uh, both of them are ferrimagnetic. And when they have like little, little sizes, they acquire a property that is called like super paramagnetism. And I'm gonna show you how this is gonna be beneficial in our research later on. Um, magma nanoparticles, uh, they have been widely utilized as a aggregate for steel industry pigments. If you guys can see uh, the pigment, they're kind of like reddish powder. Uh, they're also really uh, beneficial in biomedical biomedical applications because they don't react with the human body or anything. So they've been used as a carrier. Uh, what's, what's the name? Medicine carriers in uh, biomedical studies, and they present a low toxicity. So I think it's the first it's the first time that uh, magamai was used as a, as a method for cleaning produced water. So we have some of the properties there. And, uh, and now this is the water treatment summary. So at the beginning, I was mentioning that the methods that we have right now, they're not widely efficient or they're not cost efficient. Uh, they're kind of complicated. And we have to hear like some of the costs uh, for different methods. We have the microfiltration, the ultrafiltration with uh, polymeric different type of membranes. We have the reverse osmosis, we have nanofiltration, the emulsifiers as well, that uh, they're expensive. And at the same time, it's a problem that what are we gonna do next with this uh, chemical compound? So from previous studies, uh, the one that was used for oil removal in these kind of cases was the magnetite. So I'm showing here like three different studies that were conducted in the past. Uh, magnetite nanoparticles were covered or coated with different compounds in order to make them efficient uh, in the moment of like detach the oil from the water, from the produced water. Uh, so this is more like our experimental part, the experimental part of this research. So the synthesis of the magma nanoparticles, uh, these nanoparticles were manufactured following three different, uh, different co-precipitation techniques. So chemical co-precipitation was the method that we uh, decided to go for because it was simple, was efficient. Uh, so we studied uh, three different um, studies, that sounds bad, but okay. We like uh, mainly went for the three dif uh, different studies. The first one was uh, Nasari in 2014 and then Wu and Nordin. So all of them, we follow different procedures. We found like different production times. The amount of nanoparticles that we were producing were different as well. So at the end, we decided to go uh, for the simplest one, right? As we can see here, the production time, the first method was just 40, uh, 40 minutes and the yield per reaction volume was also the higher, the highest. So we decided to go with this method. So the selected method was called the high yielding method and the, produce, uh, the product that we got was labeled as a batch 001. The reagent that we use here was the iron chloride in ferric and ferrous form as, a, uh, as hydrates because it was like easier for us to manipulate this. And uh, we use ammonium, ammonium hydroxide. The equipment was a very basic equipment. It was a jacketed reactor with speed control there. A uh, thermometer, a pH meter. And this is the procedure that we follow. Uh, it was, in theory, like very simple. We use 125 milliliters of deionized water and we just put it in the reactor. And then uh, we kept the temperature at 27 Celsius degrees. 
Uh, after this, uh, we had at this point, we add the chloride, the hexahydrate and the tetrahydrate, the ferric and ferrous chloride. And then what we had was like, we result, we ended up with a chloride um, solution was kind of, kind of like orange when we created it. And then uh, after this, 125 milliliters of 28% ammonium hydroxide solution was poured into the reactor. So if we want to think about this as uh, like a titration reaction, it's kind of like it was, it's not exactly that we went to achieve a pH of seven. We wanted to be a little bit higher basic, but at the end we ended up with a brown precipitate uh, that there were the nanoparticles. So we needed to collect this, um, clean them and dry them in order to get a powder. Like, I don't know if you guys can like see it, but this is the powder that we ended up with. These are the nanoparticles. And after we created these uh, little guys, what we did, uh, we proceed to the characterization. The first thing we did was the, uh, we applied the dynamic light scattering uh, in order to find the hydrodynamic diameter of these uh, particles. So the hydrodynamic diameters, we got like different, different sizes. This at the end of the day doesn't really like told us much because it's like a, combina a good combination of the properties that we needed for uh, our application. So we just basically got here the, uh, the size. So this one is the FTIR analysis. This was very important because we were like, we had a procedure and we were producing nanoparticles, but we needed to make sure we, need we needed to assess the chemical composition of these nanoparticles. So this is what we got. In the left, we're gonna have a spectrum that is showing us wavelengths from like around 600 to 3000. Um, so the important peaks, like you can see peaks, we are analyzing three different, um, two different types of uh, magamides. We have the commercial magamide, the synthesized, and two different types of synth uh, synthesized magamide in the, in the lab. So what we got from here is that uh, if you guys can see the peak around like 587, so what that peak indicates is that we have an iron and oxygen bond, and then we're gonna have a peak around 1600, and then another one around 3300, that those are going to indicate the nitrogen and hydrogen bonds and the oxygen and hydrogen stretching. So basic, basically what we did, like we were assessing like the, um, the chemical composition, so we were certain that these nanoparticles were magamite. Because uh, if we, so this chemical reaction has like different path, and it could be like hematite, and the hematite didn't have the the properties that we wanted to have. We didn't want to use magnetite, so yeah. And the second one in the right, so it's like a closer look to the wavelength spectrum. Uh, what we are assessing here is the um, lattice parameters, so. Magnetite and magamite, they have a, like a really similar composition, but uh, from previous studies, we can tell that these peaks are in the correct position. So for magamite, the magnetic force. So we measured the magnetic force of these little guys. Uh, we, in the lab, we were able to measure the magnetic force in order to find the saturation magnetization that is a really important property for our nanoparticles. Uh, this is because uh, this property is going to explain how the nanoparticles are behaving in the presence of a magnetic field. So let's say I have these nanoparticles here, and if they're magnetic and they have a high um, saturation magnetization or magnetic force moment, in the moment that I apply a magnet, they're going to be attracted to that magnet. And this is very important because uh, at some point we would like to recover these nanoparticles, and this is a way to do it. So this, this property was really important. And then this is the other property, the zero potential. So the saturation magnetization is telling me the, um, like the reaction of the nanoparticles with a magnet is present, right? So this zero potential is describing me the surface of the nanoparticles and how this surface is going to interact with the droplet, the oil droplets that I want to remove. So this, the zero potential is telling me like how, um, how this relationship is going to be because uh, the droplets, the end droplets in the, so this charge in the surface of the oil droplets are going to be negative 
And we, uh, so from previous literature, we assess that uh, the, the charge in the nanoparticles was positive. So the idea was like for them to attract the oil. And then uh, we also characterized the produced water. So we had the three different samples. So you guys are gonna see PW. So the first one was Oklahoma. The second one was Oklahoma as well. I just labeled it like OKF. And the third one was uh, produced water from Argentina. So all of them had different oil concentrations, 70, almost 46 and 88. We also measure different, um, different properties to, to make sure that those other properties were not like uh, interfering with the process. So this concentration was measured using an oil content analyzer. So this oil content analyzer is very, very simple, a very, very simple method to uh, determine this concentration. It uses a non-dispersive infrared spectroscopy. Uh, the procedure for this, like we always uh, perform a calibration and then we did the oil extraction from the water sample and just the measurement. How we did this, like this. Uh, so it's very simple. We had little like uh, glass vials, just like the ones I have here. And we put 10 milliliters of produced water and then uh, we will add 10 milliliters of the solvent that we have in the picture. And it was just a matter of mixing together and let it sit like for about 30 seconds. And then uh, we will put the sample. Um, so we'll, we will see two phases, right? The, the heavy phase is gonna be a solvent that has the oil in it. So we'll extract this and we'll put this in the measurement cell, we put it in the oil content analyzer and that will give us a, a reading. Uh, we also, okay, so after the characterization of the, of the produced water, we had to uh, prepare the, what we call the mag uh, magnetic nanoparticle suspension or the nano suspension. Because we realized that just adding the nanoparticles to the oil, the produced water, it was not, it was not going to be as efficient. So what we did, we created a, a solution with a concentration of five milligrams per milliliter. And we sonicate this in the sonifier that I have in the picture for two minutes. So we ended up with a mixture, with a liquid, like the one you guys can see in the picture. And later on, let me show you, let me explain like the, uh, the overall process that we perform here. Uh, so in the bottom part, we're gonna have the uh, the oil content analyzer. So that's how we find out the initial concentration of oil. And then we're gonna have the sonifier. So one important thing is that my nanoparticles were dispersed in brine. So we try like different concentrations of brine, we try different type of water. And we went to, uh, we went with 3% uh, concentration uh, brine because it was the one that showed better performance. And then after we have this mixture, we will have 10 milliliters of uh, produced water and 10 milliliters of nano suspension. We, uh, we put this together in a one-to-one -one ratio. And then after that, we apply a magnet. So when we apply a magnet, what we saw is that uh, the nanoparticles were being attached to the magnet and the water was clean. After that, uh, so we again, test the oil concentration to make sure we were removing oil and we recycle the, we clean and recycle the, our nanoparticles. So this is the oil removal efficiency that we got from the process. So during the test, we were using two different types of, mainly two, uh, two types of magamides. The first one was the one we selected and produced in the lab. And the second one was a commercial magamide that we just ordered from, from a lab. And this is how like uh, we compare these two type of magamite. We can see like uh, the synthesized magamite overall performed really well versus the other type. And we have pictures here of the magnetic separation. It took like about 20 seconds, in some cases less than that. So we just started with a like a brown color mixture and we ended up with the nanoparticles uh, at the bottom. And then with a the clear water, it indicates that the oil was being attached to the nanoparticles and the nanoparticles were being recovered as well by from this process. 
So the critical nanoparticle concentration. So we have the nanoparticle, we have the water, we have everything. And now the question was like, okay, what's my optimal concentrate, like concentration of nanoparticles to clean this water, you know? Cause I can use a lot of nanoparticles and then my process, uh, my project will be, wouldn't be uh, economical, like feasible. So uh, we try with different concentrations. We try with, we started with 10 milligrams per milliliter and then we went to 7.5, 7, 6.5 until we got to 2.5. So 2.5 milligrams per milliliter uh, is the concentration, the minimum re concentration required to start like extracting oil from the water. Uh, if you can, at the end of the day, like what we did is like we use five milligrams per milliliter. I think I mentioned it before. And it was because even though 2.5 was doing the job, it was taking so long to do it. So it would take like about 15 minutes. And that's a long retention time for this kind of process. So this is the removal efficiency and the residual oil content. Like as you can guys, uh, yeah, I can see the removal efficiency was always higher than 97% in these cases. So we ended up with uh, the oil, a final oil concentration in the samples at less than four ppm. Uh, so the nanoparticles demonstrate just a strong ability to emulsify and separate oil from water. So the gas chromatography analysis, we performed this at the end of our, uh, our experiments. And it was because is it was going to tell us like if we are actually removing so we knew you know physically that we were removing oil because it was a content analyzer uh told us about what kind of hydrocarbons we were removing or you know like the chemical part of it so we can see this is the spectrum uh the chromatogram of the water we were using uh i used to produce water from oklahoma sample and as we can see, so our equipment was able to characterize the C13, uh, it was 13, 14, 15, and 16. And then uh, from literature and previous studies, we determined that the peaks you guys see like around seven and 7.5 uh, was C21 uh, and C22. So this is the water before treatment. And then I have uh, three different graphs here, as you can see the green one and the purple one. We can see like the peaks, the high peaks that we had at the beginning, they disappear after the water was treated. So that means our nanoparticles were, uh, were, were doing a good job. After this, uh, we needed a method to recycle our nanoparticles. It's not like we use them and then we just throw it away because no, we needed to show how many times we were able to recycle these nanoparticles. So uh, as I told you guys before, we created the, nano, the nano suspension, we did the process, we mix the water with the uh, with this suspension, we apply a magnetic field, uh, we decant the water, and then what we did is we took the nanoparticles attached to the to the magnet and we cleaned them. Uh, first, we cleaned them with just regular water, with the ionized water. And uh, after that, we put some ethanol, so we were able to clean the oil that was attached to the nanoparticles and like um, just kind of wash them and just make our nanoparticles clean again to use. So we did this and we tried the nanoparticles that we used before, and we were able to, um, in this case, up to 12 times and our efficiency was still uh, above 90%. So 90% of uh, efficiency was our target. After that, I didn't really count like the, the cycle, even though the, the concentration of oil is still in, like, in compliance with the regulation, but we decided that 90% was our target. So in this case, uh, I did experiments like for 12 cycles, as you can see, the last one was below 90%, but still like, this concentration was, I think it was about 7, pp, 7 ppm. And if you guys remember, the, um, the requirement was just like 29 ppm or 42 ppm daily and 29 in, in a monthly basis. And this is our third sample, the second, the second um, sample from Oklahoma. Same thing uh, in our trial number 12, the concentration, the efficiency was below 90%. Uh, 
this is what I have. This is what we achieved with my with my research. So the magma nanoparticles were able to remove uh, the oil from the uh, from the produced water up to ninety seven percent. The synthesis of the nanoparticles using the chemical co precipitation. Uh, gave us as a result a magnemite nanoparticles with really good properties. Uh, the magnetic nanoparticles can be recycled up to at least 11 times, depending on the treatment that we we're using. And due to the low cost environmental compatibility, repeated recyclability, magnemite nanoparticles offer a practical option for produced water treatment. <laughs> 